Welcome back. For those of you um, who have been following along the series, you know we're on our, our third talk now. For those of you who are joining us the first time, uh, my name is Haley Ross and I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute or CMI for short. And I'm joined here today by Marcy Marr and Kendall Banesh with the Kootenai Conservation Program or KCP for short. KCP and CMI have joined forces once again to present this webinar series, which is the eighth season of CMI's CRUD Talks and the 10th season of KCP's Winter Webinar Series. Before we get started, I want to first acknowledge that the region in which both of our organizations work is the unceded homeland of the Sinaiaks, the Sushikwakum, the Tanaka, and the Seok Okanagan peoples who have stewarded and cared for this land, water, and all living things since time immemorial. And as with the past webinars, I wanna give you an opportunity to provide your own acknowledgement. So using the chat feature, please feel free to introduce yourself and let us know whose territory you're zooming in from today. And while you do that, I'm gonna run through some logistics and introductions. So this season's webinars will explore the theme of wildlife corridors and ecological connectivity. We're welcoming eight speakers who will discuss the theme from different perspectives and provide a wide view that can inform the conservation of connected and resilient landscapes in the Columbia Basin. This year's series is financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust and by LGL Limited. Many thanks to both these organizations for ensuring that we can continue to offer this series free of charge. And thanks for, to all of you who have been tuning in and are tuning in today for the third talk in the series, where biologist Sarah Delorier will present her work with the Tanaha Nation on the creation of the forestry standards document. Sarah will discuss how Tanaha's approach seeks to enhance the values in the Forest Range Practices Act, or FERPA, by reflecting the current state of the landscape and the needs for conservation, connectivity, and an understanding that stewarding the land is more than just a responsibility, it's a right. I can see some of those acknowledgements and introductions rolling in. Thanks for participating in that. It's great to see so many of you here. And as those roll in, I'm just going to introduce briefly CMI for those of you who are not familiar. So CMI is a nonprofit and an association for people working in the various fields of ecology. We provide professional development opportunities in the form of conferences, courses and webinars that address everything from skill-based techniques to land management conundrums. Our website, of course, is a great place to learn more about what we do and it contains great resources, including proceeding documents and talk recordings from all of our major events. And you can find that at cmiae.org. And what I'd like to do now is pass it over to Marcy Marr with KCP. Thanks, Haley. Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Marcy Marr and I'm joining you on behalf of the Kootenai Conservation Program or KCP as Haley said. Um, we're a diverse network of more than 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, federal, provincial and local governments, First Nations, land trusts, agricultural producers and educational institutions who all contribute to conserving our region. The purpose of KCP's partnership is to cooperatively conserve and steward landscapes that sustain biodiversity and naturally functioning ecosystems and to generate the support and resources needed to advance this effort, including building technical knowledge in webinars like this. We're very excited to be hosting this webinar series again with CMI and would like to give a special thanks to our program sponsors without whom we would not be able to support this type of work. Now, just a couple of housekeeping uh, details and we'll get started. So this webinar is being recorded and will be posted within a week to both CMI's event uh, webpage and KCP's winter webinar series webpage. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar to add a question to the queue and we'll do our best to make our way through them. You can also use the upvote button in the Q&A. So if you see a question that is similar to yours or that you'd also like to see answered, uh, please press the thumbs up icon by that question. Back to you, Haley. Thanks, Marcy. Okay, so without further ado, we have the privilege of introducing Sarah Delorier, who will be presenting a talk called A Cultural Approach to Reconcile First Nations Stewardship Rights 
with resource management. And before I hand it over to you, I just want to read a brief bio. So Sarah graduated with a Master's of Forest Conservation from the University of Toronto with a specific research emphasis on small mammal abundance and distribution across fragmented landscapes. Sarah grew up in Montreal and currently lives in Kimberley, where she's employed with the Tanaha Nation Council as a terrestrial biologist. Sarah is a forester in training and an aspiring cat lady. Over okay. to you, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, Haley. <laughs> Welcome. All right. I hope that's looking good on your end. Looks great. Perfect. Uh, before beginning, I'd just like to preface this presentation by acknowledging that uh, I'm not a member of the Tanaha Nation. Um, I'm speaking today based on my own experiences, uh, my opinions are my own, and while I am representing the Tanaha Nation Council, I would like to reiterate that I'm not speaking on behalf of any of the distinct Tanaha Nations. And uh, I would also like to thank um, our external contractor, Marlene Mackmer, um, as much of her wisdom and knowledge has also helped go into the, creating this document and presentation. That being said, Kisu Kyukit, Hugakte Sarah Delorie, Hugakigaki Tiotiaki, Hugasukani Kyomananam. What I'm saying is hello, uh, my name is Sarah Delorie. I'm from Montreal and I currently live in Kimberley, BC. That's about the extent of my Tanaka language so far. Um, I have been highly encouraged to continue learning. Um, the only exception was the Mohawk use of the word Montreal, which is a bit more appropriate. Uh, one thing I've learned about the Tanaha language is that it is near extinction. Only a handful of fluent speakers are left, so I've been told that it's really everyone's responsibility to help preserve the language. Being from Quebec, um, I can tell you I've definitely seen some questionable language politics, but I couldn't agree more that the Tanaha language really must be preserved. It's uh, a highly contextual and setting-specific language, meaning it uh, has a very, connection, uh, very important connection to place. There are words and terms that wouldn't necessarily make sense if they were used anywhere else. Um, and because it's a language that's so based on the culture and the land. So this language requires connection to place and to people living within it. To continue living, it needs an uninterrupted chain of speakers in order to persist in the same way that many wildlife species require uh, undisrupted habitat connectivity to survive. And this map for reference is the unceded Tanaka territory and it occupies about 8% of the province of BC. The scope of this presentation is how and why the Tanaka have decided to affect industrial land use at the operational forestry scale through the creation of a forestry standards document. It is a proactive response to forest harvesting that describes the expectations of the Tanaka nation where uh, operating developing uh, within their territory occurs. I'm approaching this presentation through the lens of all living things as it is a guiding principle for Tanaha stewardship responsibilities. It is the duty to care for quite literally every living thing. It explains the intrinsic indivisibility of nature. It holds the concept of connectivity as the foundation for all relationships, for planning, and it's part of why the Tanaha are so successful um, at having a society of producers rather than just consumers, uh, having livelihoods that can be based on reciprocity, and an inherent responsibility for each individual to learn how they can contribute to the greater whole. When we're talking about connectivity and looking at it through an all living things approach, it really invites us to look at the, connect the connections that we might be missing um, as connections can be both tangible and uh, a, a philosophical concept. I would like to try to explain how connectivity occurs at every conceivable scale. I like to think that it occurs at a cosmic scale through chance and serendipity, uh, and it occurs at the mycorrhizal scale beneath our feet, a living, breathing universe replete with the fundamental building blocks of all life. I've been working with the Tanaha Nation Council for almost a year, and during my time here, I've had the opportunity to meet so many people who have shared wisdom and knowledge with me, and I've been able to make so many connections between their knowledge and my work. So I'd like to also focus this presentation on the stories, ideas, and cultural perspectives that really imbue this standards document with the life and spirit and a deep connection to place. Just to provide uh, a bit of context um, or I guess background about me, I'm a forester in training. Um, a lot of my duties with the Tanaka Nation consist of responding to forestry referrals. So mainly applications to harvest timber that are made by tenure holders or licensees. Uh, I also conduct pre and post harvest field surveys looking for values of cultural and ecological significance 
and helping to develop harvest prescriptions that are more aligned with Chinaha stewardship rights. Um, I completed my master's of forest conservation in Southern Ontario, mostly in the Carolinian life zone where the forests look very different than they do here. And uh, if you're wondering about these little buddies on my screen, well, it's because my research background was with um, small mammals and particularly with flying squirrels. So from a forestry and connectivity lens, I find this really helps me take uh, a unique approach to cup block layout, which is a, where a lot of, um, you know, the scale of my work resides. Uh, it means I'm considering things from a bit more of a micro scale. We know that squirrels can be keystone species in forests. They help support tree regeneration through the dispersal of seeds and fungal spores. They act as key dietary biomass for endangered birds and owls. Um, and I know that that knowledge really helps influence how I contribute to harvest prescriptions because I cannot help looking at a cup lock through the lens of the dispersal capacity of a cursorially challenged map. Um, as I was saying, connectivity happens at all scales. Um, an example is, you know, roads built through critical caribou habitat is a really visually striking way of explaining wildlife connectivity corridor disruptions. And that's the same way that I imagine um, a large piece of coarse woody debris acting as um, a squirrel and rodent superhighway. This little video is just for um, the enjoyment of anyone who hasn't seen a flying squirrel hop around at night um, in night vision. So all living things uh, in Tunaha is a kamas kapikapsin. This is the guiding principle behind Tunaha stewardship rights and responsibilities. Um, I'm going to just read the quote because I think it sums it up perfectly. It refer refers to the root of and relationship between all things, including land, water, animals, indigenous peoples, and the air they breathe. It describes the living balance which connects all things with the creator and with one another and is linked to Tunaha language and culture. So if the point of stewardship is to account for every living thing, every plant, every animal, it requires a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of all things, all processes, both biotic and abiotic. To care for all living things means to know and understand them first, not merely to name and categorize. Um, and I think that this can also be the guiding principle for sustainable forestry, as this was the principle that led to the creation of the Chinaga uh, Forestry Standards document, which is a cultural and ecological compendium clearly articulating Tunaha land use requirements for licensees operating within Amakis Tunaha, which is the Tunaha territory. Um, and uh, uh, so we know that British Columbia's forest industry is guided by uh, a set of values through the Forest and Range Practices Act or FERPA. But some important questions to ask about FERPA are, do these values represent the current state of the landscape? Do they prioritize a monitoring approach that emphasizes effectiveness over compliance? And is it inclusive or even aware of First Nations cultural conservation values? So the forestry standards document is a parallel set of standards to the Forest and Range Practices Act. Uh, it is based on a holistic landscape scale approach and a greater ecological context beyond timber values. It was established by Tunaha knowledge holders, Tunaha citizens, and technical subject matter experts. This Forestry Standards document, or FSD, is a guiding document to help ministries and licensees to align timber harvesting laws, planning, policies, practices with Tunaha law and the province's legal obligation to the Tunaha nation uh, by way of constitutionally protected title, rights, and governance authority. It's a living document, meaning that updates occur in it regularly, um, you know, according to changing, uh, you know, sorry, new information and uh, monitoring results that uh, become available. The KNC expects that the province and licensees uh, will operate in accordance with this FSD uh, by changing laws, regulations, policies and practices to achieve the identified outcomes and objectives. Because as of now, we know that Provincial laws and policies have negated Tunaha rights to fulfill their land and research stewardship responsibilities within the territory, and it's resulted in a steady erosion of the ecosystem on which the exercise of Tunaha rights, culture, and way of life depends. The FSD was made to reflect the current state. Um, and we know that currently biodiversity is at an unacceptable level of risk from fragmentation, cumulative impacts, accelerating climate change, uh, current forest practices have resulted in the loss and degradation of lands, water, wildlife, habitat, and other cultural values. 
And um, a lot of those cultural values include lots of traditional land use, loss of uh, connection to traditional foods, diets, and medicines, and the erosion of old growth forests. So that's why the Forest Standards document, or FSD, covers many of these same values and requirements established under FERPA, and it's even in a format that could be read like a forest stewardship plan. Um, it's the way that KNC can provide feedback on every forest stewardship plan that gets submitted to us. We provide recommendations on how to be more aligned with the Tanaha Forestry Standards, and the hope is that um, licensees will commit to Tanaha land use requirements through their own FSPs, which would be legally binding documents. Uh, we've come to understand, however, that the biggest impediment to getting Tunaha FSD uptake in forest stewardship plans is actually the legal framework itself. Uh, most licensees who wish to comply with their standards feel obliged to do so through non-legal addendums to their forest stewardship plans, uh, almost as if they have to operate outside the law in order to uh, uphold Aboriginal rights and title. We've noticed that statutory decision makers within the ministry will not necessarily encourage or enforce licensees to comply with our standards document because they are already meeting legal requirements of an FSP, even if there's you know, scientific data and traditional knowledge to contest the efficacy of those requirements in actually conserving biodiversity or mitigating land degradation. The forestry standards document provides rationale for all the values, results, and strategies it provides clear recommendations, um, both to ministry and licensees, with precise wording that Tunaka would like to see used. Um, in addition to developing this um, forestry standards document, as I said, we also conduct uh, field surveys of forest harvesting within the Tunaka territory to assess whether operations are achieving the intent and objectives of this document, and to better identify how plans and practices need to be adapted. Um, and this is done with our ECNUSTI program, um, so those are our guardian team. Since this document is meant to align with um, licensee expectations with Chinaka law, um, this is our first response to referrals. Um, and as I said, it can be read as an FSP, so it's a format that's pretty standard and pretty recognizable for any forester or ministry representative. And it allows licensees and government to see that these pieces were intentionally and proactively put in place because the Chinaka take land stewardship seriously, and so should they. In addition to providing the forest standards document as a first response to forest referrals that come in, we also provide a spreadsheet to help licensees to help process our forestry standards document. It has headings for all the information we need to meaningfully consult on a couple of proposal. It helps also to ensure standardization in the information that, receive, that we receive from all the different licensees. So we're asking for things like attribute data, age class, canopy closure, um, are, is there any logging within high value huckleberry patches? Uh, is this development within an ungulate winter range? Um, so we're asking the licensee to assess whether they're, for example, gonna be operating in an area where the old and mature forest targets in old growth management areas are in a deficit. Uh, we also basically have laid out all of our FSD values into this Excel spreadsheet for them and uh, even have distinct spreadsheets for uh, beetle salvage logging, and we're currently working on one for wildfire salvage logging referrals. And I would just like to give an example from a licensee who has been successfully completing our spreadsheet for a while. They even color code it and include a column to indicate how many of the FSD values are being met at a cup block scale. This really expedites the consultation process greatly for us. So we're not chasing after licensees for missing or withheld information. Uh, we're not spending our valuable time responding to them about things they already know. And it places the onus on the licensee to have fully understood to not have expectations in order to populate the spreadsheet. The objective behind this is one, uh, facilitate the very daunting process for which the Chinaga Nation Council does not have the capacity to manage, and that's tackling our backlog of approximately 5,000 referrals. Um, an expedited, expedited referral process by proactively articulating our stewardship responsibilities is just facilitating the whole process for us. Um, and secondly, we want to just see more precautionary management on the ground by having licensees reflect on the values of importance, taking the emphasis off timber supply, uh, and encouraging a more holistic approach. Perhaps in filling out a template, a licensee might realize, well, we're, propose we're proposing a 90 hectare clear cut uh, through a stand that meets AGMA recruitment criteria for a landscape unit in a deficit of old, and this stand has ungulate winter range and grizzly bear values. 
Perhaps this insights a reflection about the quality and sustainability of the forestry being conducted. I would just like to uh, also now pinpoint a few of the specifics of the FSD that are uh, really based on cultural and ecological importance and their link to connectivity. The first being old growth forests. Um, the Tanaha Nation participated very actively in the old growth strategic review that was done uh, through the province of BC and we really support its recommendations. So we support seeing a moratorium on old growth logging. We support more stringent rules for incursions into and replacements of old growth management areas. Um, we don't necessarily want to concede, uh, continue to see the approval to cut and erode old growth forests for timber, for road building, for wildfire salvage. Um, there are so many wildlife species that um, are really old forest obligates. They cannot persist or live outside of these very specific interior habitat conditions. And perhaps replacement areas can be found, but it still might likely mean uh, an extirpation of a local meta population of species if they are not able to, um, you know, reach the replacement forest patch or if the other patch has a reduced patch size. Um, this can result in a decline in overall species survivorship if any other subpopulation was dependent on the flow of genetic material from that meta population. When talking about old growth replacement areas, uh, I heard a knowledge holder once ask a licensee if they were gonna go in and hand out eviction notices to all the critters that were living them, living there and give them clear directions on how to get to this new replacement AUGMA. And I just think that's a really good way to think about it. Uh, we also would like to see um, avoided harvesting in any potential recruitment old forest. Um, and we'd like to see uh, old growth management area redeployment to the highest value uh, old growth stands. Um, lastly, we want to see old growth management areas um, turned into landscape level retention areas. So basically used as anchors to incorporate uh, adjacent intact old forest, recruitment old and interior forest, just to designate larger old and mature patches for retention for critical species at risk, as well as for climate refugia. Uh, another value that we have is through our uh, cultural conservation value program. We would like to see, um, first of all, uh, field surveys done pre and post harvest, um, hopefully by our uh, RFUC team, by registered qualified professionals. Um, we would like to see licensees conducting systematic pre-development surveys for any animal and plant species at risk, uh, endangered forest, key wildlife guilds, um, and we're calling our survey uh, an eco-cultural survey. We would like that to be done in tandem with a uh, timber cruise. Um, this would require um, that the province be ready to issue, or the province be ready to not issue cutting permits when consultation determines that an area is a no-go zone based on cultural and ecological concerns. And the objective here is that based on all of this collective information, we're hoping planning foresters can come away with an idea of the entire food web. Um, for the stand that they're trying to manage. A knowledge holder shared with me in my first week here that if I'm going to look after the forests, I should be able to do it on horseback. Um, this comment was meant specifically for the Douglas fir ponderosa pine forest of the NDT4. And what they're trying to say is that if I'm on a horse and the forest is so dense and ingrown that I can't see through it or get through it, uh, then that's not how it's supposed to look. And the FSD really tries to convey these highly insightful cultural knowledge pieces. Um, so we wanna see development of retention strategies for uh, ungulate winter range, wildfire risk reduction, invasive plant mitigation, climate change adaptation. And a lot of these models uh, have actually already been proposed through the Greg Green model. Um, and they turn out that they can satisfy a large range of these concerns at the same time. Green up. Uh, this is a Forest and Range Practices Act value that requires uh, a previously harvested stand to reach a minimum of 2.5 meter height in regrowth before uh, harvesting in an adjacent stand is possible. The idea here is to allow any replanting efforts to have established and maintain some semblance of seral stage distribution. The Chinana feel that the 2.5 meter green up is not sufficient, sufficiently precautionary and that the increased green up height uh, of five meters would be uh, more precautionary and deal with a greater range of concerns. I have to say that this is definitely the standard that we receive the most pushback on because I think it's interpreted as a strategy to delay or slow down harvest and negatively impact timber availability. 
But realistically, in my mind, this is the value with some of the most concrete science behind it, addressing some of the most dire environmental issues associated with harvesting. Uh, one, if we moved from a 2.5 meter to a five meter green up height, uh, this would allow the chance for a proper succession. We want the forest to be able to do what it knows how to do, and that's regenerate to a state of resiliency. This means not brushing and spraying herbicide on forests when they are at the climax of plant diversity at the earliest stages of competition and succession. You know, forestry has the potential to be sustainable and uh, timber and wood products have the potential to be renewable resources. But to do that, we need to learn how to grow forests and not monocrops. We know that due to accelerating climate change, um, the impacts to regenerating stands by rising temperatures, more severe and prolonged drought, increased uh, frequency and severity of wildfires is all leading to a documented increase in tree mortality and declines in tree regeneration success. We've noted that um, you know, within the Chinaba Territory and even the Forest Practices Board has put out documentation that um, the increased need for replanting and reduced rates of free growing and stocking levels um, in the last few decades. And we don't necessarily have the confidence that a tree height of 2.5 meter is really setting these uh, the stand on a successful regeneration trajectory. Uh, we know that um, increasing from 2.5 to 5 meter uh, regeneration will reduce wildlife disturbance and displacement. Um, it'll help promote suitable wildlife habitat and maintain wildlife connectivity. Uh, 2.5 meters is not an effective screen and it does not effectively reduce wildlife visibility. It impairs wildlife movement through these stands in order to um, avoid detection and predation in, you know, for many uh, mammals, ungulates, fur bears, carnivores, bats, um, and most bird species, they need some level of canopy cover and taller forest structure for breeding, foraging, roosting, security cover, snow interception, and shade. So we don't necessarily find that um, these 2.5 meter stands are uh, appropriately regenerated and if anything they can cause kind of an ecological trap um, because animals will be lured into it for the opportunity to forage but then they can be more easily predated upon. Um, it also limits forest fragmentation and the impact on forest interior habitat conditions and associated uh, forest biodiversity. We know that um, 2.5 meter height promotes more rapid turnover and fragmentation in landscape patterns and creates a mosaic of early seral distribution and adjacent clear cuts. Um, this is characterized by a high density of edge habitats, which most forest species avoid or experience higher levels of predation in. Uh, and it's coupled with a low density of interior forest habitat where forest specialists need to live. Suzanne Samard has taught us from a nutrient perspective that mature trees can reach out through clear cuts to help regenerate new stands. And uh, Greg Utsik's climate modeling demonstrates that mature stands can act as a, a climate refugia, you know, providing a cooler microclimate and high value interior forest habitat. Um, so for us, we see this as more shade, more individual mature trees, meaning less moisture loss through evapotranspiration, uh, less drying of vegetation resulting in higher ignition potential, um, and a lot of that is due to the water loss through osmosis during the photosynthetic process. Um, and these uh, pressures are only going to increase with an increasingly warming atmosphere. One uh, piece of pushback that we get is that, well, if you have larger trees, you're going to have more drought stress from competing root systems. But I think we know that with a more resilient um, forest is a higher diversity in tree species. So you wouldn't necessarily have that problem thanks to a variety of different rooting depths. We really feel that the future timber supply is not assured with the current level of cut and the lack of regeneration success. And we believe that five meters is gonna help uh, ensure sustainability. It's gonna help ensure stands that are harvested and stocked today will be worth harvesting in the future. And it's just gonna provide a sense of certainty to the wood industry and ensure a future timber supply. Um, this value really satisfies uh, some insightful and very simple piece of knowledge that was passed on to me, which was don't plant what wasn't there already and don't cut what you know what won't, won't grow back. Um, some other values that we really look to um, incorporate on the landscape through the forestry standards document is an increase in partial cutting. Um, right now, the standard is about five stems per hectare retention, which 
you can see looks uh, kind of pitiful. Uh, we don't really understand the rationale behind five cents per hectare. It doesn't seem to provide any meaningful ecological value, uh, wildlife habitat value, or regeneration success. Um, seems to be a more costly silviculture practice for replanting, and it's going to result in areas that are really overgrown, requiring brushing, and are a higher wildfire risk, um, as well as removing the ability for animals to help restore it to the landscape. Uh, we also like to see cup log sizes limited to 40 hectares where appropriate. Um, you know, a 40 hectare or larger open, opening is not necessarily um, conducive for the movement of creatures who, uh, you know, are, are not so good on all on all fours or all twos, you know. Uh, and we also would like to see that um, more of the values in FERPA be uh, based on effectiveness monitoring. You know, effectiveness this monitoring was committed to through the Kootenai Boundary Land Use Plan, but it hasn't necessarily been undertaken for all the values to determine whether current forest management regimes are maintaining adequate quality, quantity, and distribution of habitat for species at risk and regionally important wildlife. We would also like to see an increase in wildlife tree retention areas to at least 10% at the cutting permit scale, um, retaining higher value wildlife trees and larger patches that are going to be less prone to blow down um, if this is satisfying a wildlife tree patch uh, objective. I don't actually understand what the objective is meant to fulfill. Um, you know, wildlife tree retention areas are intended to serve the needs of over 70 wildlife tree dependent species. And um, we also don't want to see co-location of wildlife tree retention areas with other constrained areas um, that should only be applied with both objectives are fully met. So uh, an example of this is that often um, a riparian area has its own uh, retention strategy and wildlife tree patches will kind of be thrown in with that as a, a way to satisfy both objectives, but not necessarily retain more trees on the landscape. We would like to see a wildlife tree density requirement um, so that you have at least five wildlife trees that have over 30 centimeters in diameter per hectare. And we would like to see these wildlife tree patches anchored around high value wildlife trees or snags and veterans, which are large older trees. And this is an actual wildlife tree patch that I found that doesn't seem to, you know, um, meet many of the criteria that wildlife actually need. This image here is a pretty popular graphic from a principle of ecological knowledge, uh, eco sorry, ecological economics called degrowth, um, but I think it fits in pretty well here. We can't make the Forest and Range Practices Act um, values effective until we change the underlying assumptions, um, until we see science driving policy and not the other way around, and until timber is surpassed as the higher overarching value. Until then, we're just trying to change a framework that we know already doesn't work. Um, we don't necessarily need more of the same. We shouldn't have to work immeasurably hard to make tiny amendments to forest stewardship plans. And we know that less of the same is still creating problems that we currently have no solutions to. We need something completely different. Um, I think terms that are meant to stand for progress and equity are th thrown around like consultation, traditional ecological knowledge, policymaking, but in actuality, these terms are only really intended to reinforce the colonial agenda. Um, consultation was intended to be used as a tool to ethically justify the continuance of dispossessive resource extractivism. It was never meant to be used as a tool or an instrument to dis uh, disrupt the system. And I think it's some time for something that will. Speaking with a knowledge holder about the difficulty of trying to get license holders to be more consistent with our standards document, uh, they told me, you know, you can't compare apples with apples if you didn't pick the apples. So what that means to me is we can't expect to understand the same things uh, in different ways, in the same way if we're considering them through a different language, uh, a different system of valuation. If we don't understand the inseparable nature of an ecosystem, then we can't adequately care for it and ensure its persistence because we don't value each component's contribution to its greater whole. This requires us to change our language, stocking standards, whose standards are we stocking to and what value or objective are they meant to fulfill, annual allowable cut, Almost every knowledge holder I've spoken to insists that the cut is too high, and I can assure you that if it were up to them, they wouldn't allow it. Uh, I had someone in a meeting use the term standing timber, and a knowledge holder had to correct them and say, actually, they're called trees. And to me, when a knowledge holder shares an idea that um, an area uh, that was used very, you know, a traditionally important hunting area for moose, for example, um, 
they would tell us that it had a certain population size historically, then we should be managing that we cannot harvest beyond the point of that carrying capacity if this is the knowledge that's been passed on to us. So I'm bringing this back to how knowledge affects the way that we connect to and interact with the world. Um, much of the English language is rooted in the possessive and it makes it easier to objectify things. So I think that speaking a language based on place and connection instills a different way of knowing and seeing, and it helps develop a sense of belonging. So I challenge you with permission, of course, to learn some of the words in the language of the First Nation whose land you work and live on. Understanding the meaning and stories behind those words, um, you know, for example, in Tunaha, the word for guardian, aknusti, also can be used for a midwife, which absolutely blew my mind um, to think that we must shepherd in new life into this world with the same heart we use when we're caring for it and ensuring its health. Relationships are what give things meaning, so we must seek to understand rather to, than to characterize or manage not just seeing the forest through the trees, but understanding the relationships within each forest that makes them unique and in a sense, irreplaceable. We need to understand who came before, who is there now, and what will be left after we've gone. I'd like to just leave you with this image, uh, reminding us that connectivity corridors happen at every scale. This one, unfortunately, uh, connects my cat with uh, my neighbor's sandbox in their backyard. And with that, I will say taha, which is the Tunaha word for that's all folks. Thank you. Sarah, what a well-delivered talk. Nice work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, folks, we're gonna move on to the q and I'm sure there are no shortage of questions. Uh, Marcy Mar is going to facilitate the Q&A for us. Um, please direct any questions you have not in the chat, but into the Q&A function. Once again, if there's a question there that you're interested in hearing the answer to as well, give it a thumbs up. That'll help us to determine uh, which questions are most popular. And we have one more person joining us here to help with the Q&A, and that is Marlene Mackmer, who Sarah referred to earlier. Um, so who is Marlene? I, I think a lot of people on this call probably know, um, but I'll just, give a, full, a few little bullet points here. So Marlene Mackmer is a wildlife ecologist with over three decades of experience. Um, she is owner of Pandolin Ecological Research, a consulting firm based out of Nelson. Um, she was the board member for the Forest Practices Board for six years. And she's been a technical advisor to the KNC, the Tanaha Nation Council for six years. Um, oh no since 2007, sorry. And she was integral to the development of the Tanaha Forestry Standards document and continues to work for the KNC in a contractor role. So I'll pass it over to you, Marcy and Marlene and Sarah. Thanks. Great, thanks Haley. Welcome Marlene. Great Thank job, you. Sarah. Yeah. Good job. So we've got a few questions and I'll just um, I'll just start, start in on them and see how we do. So the first one, um, are there thoughts on enhancing forest growth ecosystem restoration by using mycorrhizal fungi in combination with replanting and seeding? Yeah, definitely, Marlene. Do you have any uh, specific thoughts on that? <laughs> well, to be honest, it's a great question. Um, I would have to say that with respect to discussions that we've had around our forest standards document, that is kind of, there's results, there's strategies, and there's practices. That would be a practice that would be something, certainly I think uh, Tanaha would promote. Um, however, it's not something that has been uh, the topic of our discussions and actually developing the Tanaha FSD and taking it to where it is. Most of the emphasis has focused on achieving consensus amongst Tanaha citizens, and then having that document uh, respected and implemented in a manner that improves stewardship on the land base. So this, it's kind of the next step type question. <clears throat> okay, great, thanks. Uh, so we've got another question. Uh, the, the eco-cultural assessments are clearly not taking place before government approvals. What actions are being taken to ensure that this does not continue? 
Uh, yeah, we've actually had to have a, a conversation with some of the decision makers recently with the ministry who were under the impression that when a licensee informed them consultation is complete, we're ready to have our cutting permit issued, that uh, consultation was not necessarily complete on uh, the side of the First Nation. Um, so we're now trying to develop a process for that where um, the decision makers are asking the Chinoha Nation before uh, actually starting to issue uh, permits or closing the consultation period to ensure that all of our concerns have actually been met. And I would say the actions that are being taken, unfortunately, right now, the biggest impediment is just a lack of capacity. We try to get out to the most sensitive and ecologically and culturally important areas, um, but we can't always do that within the constrained uh, consultation window. So unfortunately, sometimes approvals can go ahead before we've had time to do that. Yeah. And what was the number of referrals you told me? Was it 5,000, the backlog of, of what you're dealing with on your end? Yeah. Those are not just forestry, but I'd say they're a, a huge component will be forestry referrals. Yeah. Um, so there's a follow-up question to this as well. And if you could speak a bit to the failure to change the green up standards. Um, it's a failure to reduce the cut and the uh, apportionment obligations. And we understand, you know, a lot of licensees, when we ask them, would you be able to increase your retention strategy in this block or um, anyways, ask them to inc increase the retention strategy? Sometimes the answer is actually no, because if they don't harvest a specific uh, amount, they're going to lose their license or their mill will shut down. And it's not that we're not empathetic to those um you know, to those constraints. We're just trying to find a way that uh, we can remediate the two where we can see proper stewardship um, actually happening and it doesn't have to, doesn't have to happen at the expense of good forestry. Mm -hmm. Marlene, anything to add about the, the green up piece of this? We continue to get a lot of questions on our rationale for the increased green up and um, I mean, clearly, by implementing this, it would slow the rate of cut. But that is a secondary um, effect of implementing it. And the TNA have continued to provide repeatedly to government and licensees the, ra the, the primary rationale, which is one based on biodiversity and ecosystem health, really. It's, it, it melds really well with the new framework that is in draft. So, you know, yes, it would slow the rate of cut. And that wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? <laughs> okay, next one up. Um, what are your thoughts about the FLP process? Oops, sorry. Somebody has um, shifted the questions on me. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts about the FLP process and the degree to which it has the capacity to address some of the issues identified in the licensee developed SFPs? Uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to sit on the FLP planning table uh, while I was up in uh, Quinell for a few months, and now we're starting it again in the Kootenai Boundary region. I have hope. Um, I think some of the most ambitious rollout goals are five to ten years, so I don't think that we can wait that long, to be honest. Uh, I would say that there's more hope right now in potentially the new biodiversity and ecosystem health framework that's coming out, uh, because it does one thing that the FLP lacks, which is um, addressing all of the values, so not just from forestry, but cumulative effects from mining, from range. Uh, it's just a more uh, holistic approach, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I would just uh, want to add one thing that people might not be aware of is that as part of the Kootenai Lake Timber Supply Review right now, the Tanaha Enhanced Forest Standards are being modeled as a comparison to the base case. Mm. So what's going on is we have integrated these stand standards to the extent possible into a, a KESS or Tanaha Enhanced Standards scenario. And so all the timber supply review runs are looking at the implications of implementing these measures and comparing them to the base case scenario. And we will have output which demonstrates the timber supply impact of each of our uh, Tanaha standards measures. And we will also know the carbon sequestration and storage implications of each of those measures. Mm 
So that's part of the Kootenai Lake Timber Supply Review, and it's going to give us a lot of information that's been lacking to date, because many of the licensees, as well as government, are asking us, well, what are the implications of these measures if we implement them? We don't have that information. Well, we're going to have that information through the Timber Supply Review. We're just, I'm working on the chapter right now, and that will really help inform uh, adaptive management of the standards, as well as uh, Tanaha leadership decision making going forward, which again will feed right into the FLP, for instance, for a, a Kootenai Lake TSA in future. Just yes, gonna really. sneak in for a second. Sorry to interrupt. Mar Marcy, I just want to let you know that I gave you some faulty technical information and told you that your QA would show up in order of upvote but you have to do it yourself. So there's a drop down menu at the top and you can order it by most upvotes that way. Okay, I'll ask a question and then I'll, I'll figure this out while all these guys yeah. are considering totally. it. So um, thanks Sarah for really providing some um, some look at, at uh, what you, you have in terms of templates. And, and so are there any licensees who have successfully implemented um, KNC's forestry standards document? Uh, yes, and um, so I, I can't speak for the larger organization or what's going on in the rest of BC, but I have to say that um, the East Kootenai branch of CANFOR has been um, honestly outstanding, like the, the licensee who's been the most willing to work with us and through, um, you know, their adoption of our standards and their willingness to make on the ground changes, it's actually provided the space for us to have a meaningful relationship with them. Uh, you would go out and do field tours together. Uh, we're actively co-developing harvest prescriptions. They're willing to, you know, change the paradigm. I'd say we're seeing a bit of a culture shift because they're willing to try new wildlife tree retention areas, partial cutting, new management strategies, and kind of just change the way the forestry is done. So, uh, yeah, I would just like to commend the East Kootenai branch of Canford. Great. Okay, next question. Um, so you mentioned effectiveness monitoring as being important. Uh, what values would be used to monitor, used in monitoring to determine success? And are those economic or ecologically based? For example, when we harvest versus, is there a healthy functioning ecosystem? Sarah, do you want me to tackle that question? Go for it, Marlene, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Okay, I, I mean, I think if we start at base principles, as Sarah had mentioned, the Kootenai Boundary Land Use Plan had a commitment in it to effectiveness monitoring of things like uh, old and mature forest targets, uh, grizzly bear gar orders, caribou uh, core area retention. There were a list of things in there that were to be monitored for effectiveness, but none of that's ever happened. And so we look at that and, you know, as we are transitioning now to a biodiversity and ecosystem health framework, there's an opportunity to really look back at the effectiveness of the policies we have because uh, basically the framework's changing. So there's an opportunity as we move to a new framework to basically uh, identify uh, priority indicators from a cultural perspective, things like old growth, uh, things Sarah discussed, grizzly bear, caribou, uh, various other uh, types of indicators, cultural plants, for instance, rare ecological communities, um, and to basically develop monitoring protocols for those and follow up. So pre-harvest, post-harvest, and look at the effectiveness of maintaining or even enhancing those values on the landscape. Um, for something like huckleberries, for instance, through partial cutting, you could conceivably actually improve the habitat for huckleberries. But, uh, you know, we need information. We need systematic monitoring before and after. We also need systematic pre-development surveys so we can actually identify those values and ensure that the prescriptions made are reflective of enhancing and maintaining those and then go back and monitor later. And all of that information will inform sort of adaptive management of our Tanaha standards as well as, you know, licensee practices going forward. But there needs to be a willingness to do that work. And it is, it's quite a task. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Marlene. And this is a follow up to that. So, so how long would effectiveness monitoring be required, and and what what would uh, regulate this? And in this person's experience, this is uh, Hannah Neiman. She says, my experience with FAA and WSA uh, S eleven has been monitoring periods of three to five years. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you that. Uh, Existing monitoring typically is sort of short-sighted and, uh, you know, to really uh, grasp um, the effects of land use practices, you need to roll the monitoring out over a longer period. I do see a lot of opportunities with monitoring, though, particularly monitoring where uh, Tanaha guardians, First Nations guardians are involved so that the scope of the monitoring can be expanded to include cultural values. And, um, you know, I really think that uh, with respect to First Nations and their involvement on the land base, they need to be intimately involved in the monitoring component. It is, is something that they do anyway, but it needs to be formalized and it needs to be reported out as well. <clears throat> um, so again, Long-term monitoring is what we're looking at, not one, two, three, and five years after some kind of a forestry practice and boom, you write a report. It's it's not like that. Anything to add, Sarah? No, I'd say Marlene is definitely the, uh, the expert here on effectiveness monitoring. So. Okay. Um, so next question is, um, what is the Tunaha Forestry view on replanting deciduous trees? I'd say um, the emphasis is not as much on replanting deciduous as it is on, first of all, conserving it on the landscape, making sure you have nice, you know, mature cottonwood patches, uh, using that as your retention areas, they're really high value. Uh, Aspen, um, we, you know, definitely want to see that uh, persist on the landscape and just allowing for natural succession, natural regeneration. We don't want to see, um, you know, brushing and glyphosate sprayed on deciduous trees. Um, they're definitely anchors and building blocks of a healthy forest. They're providing the shade for the next generation coming in below it. So basically let them do what they're, they're trying to do. Yeah, and so follow-up question to this is, um, this person's seen some great information on Stop the Spray BC and is wondering if you could comment on the herbicide spraying tolerance, KNC and the Chinaha. Um, from the Tunaha perspective, I don't have enough information to comment on their use of glyphosate. Um, Marlene, I don't know if you've heard anything else uh, since you've been working here? Uh, I think, I mean, <clears throat> based on all the feedback that I've had from Tunaha citizens, as you mentioned, Sarah, the emphasis is on maintaining existing deciduous values, trees and shrubs, and ensuring that they do their job to nutrify the soil and prepare it for uh, succession. And, um, you know, so intuitively in my mind, I don't think glyphosate spraying is consistent with that approach at all. However, I've never sat down and had that discussion in a site-specific manner for a specific case. Um, referrals that come in, typically, you know, we respond with um, that practice being discouraged because of its potential implications on species at risk, for instance, many of which uh, are occupying amphibians, invertebrates, uh, rare sensitive species that are occupying areas near wetlands, for instance, that are often being sprayed and, and other sort of forest seep sites and things. So no, I, I do not think that is a practice that uh, Tanaha would be in favor of based on what I've seen so far. <clears throat> Okay, um, shifting gears a bit, uh, is there a, a current certification process that would allow implementation of First Nation values? Um, That's an interesting question in the sense that, as Sarah mentioned, Canfor in the East Kootenai seems to be the licensee that has really made some strides in implementing the FSD. And I would say on their um, their FSC certified lands in particular, they hit, you know, those, those are uh, to some extent compliant with the FSD already. There's less work to do there to incrementally, you know, improve. Um, I'm not aware of any 
cultural uh, forest certification? But that's a very good question. Um, I do believe when FSE, for instance, looks at, does an audit, they have inquiries in a section in their audit process where they are asking specifically about relationships with nations, consultation with nations, what, you know, what uh, is the rapport um, and how are First Nations uh, being accommodated, but I'm not aware of a First Nations certification process per se. Great question. Yeah, and and related to this is, um, you know, what it what is the flexibility within FERPA? I I'm gonna say little to none in the sense that, like I was saying, most uh, licensees who do, you know, on the ground um, implementation of our standards document don't feel like they can don't feel like they have the flexibility to include that in their FSP because it's legally binding and um, it doesn't allow them the flexibility to actually negotiate with First Nations, I'd say on more of a cup lock to cup lock basis. So I'm gonna say it's, uh, yeah, it puts you in a bit of a, a hand bind. That's not a good expression. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you made that clear in your presentation. Okay, um, so you've been getting lots of kudos and love there in the the chat, uh, Sarah, and, um, and this person writes, uh, great presentation and support for the larger paradigm shift in how forest and wildland uh, resources are viewed and managed um, and is wondering, in view of climate change and drought stressors and extreme wildland fire events, how are these realities and risks factored into the management plans and restoration plans? Yeah, we are asking uh, licensees to thin overgrown stands. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we don't want to see huge clear cuts anymore. We want to see really good partial retention um, that's I'm going to say more reflective of what forests in the NDT three and four would look like. Um, you know, he, people say that big clear cuts uh, can be better at emulating, you know, natural disturbance. But if anyone's seen a clear cut and a recently burned stand, they don't look anything alike. Um, so I would say that to manage these realities and risks, yeah, we're asking for more partial cutting. We're asking for less clear cut, which just leads to, you know, a thick ingrown stand that's a way higher wildfire risk. Uh, we're asking to maintain deciduous trees um, as anchors and fuel breaks across the landscape. Um, yeah, Marlene, you're welcome to jump in if I'm missing some. Yeah, I think what you're saying, it, I mean, if you look at the FSD, there are multiple ways that Tanaha are asking for forest retention to be increased. Things like uh, mainline FSR buffers, higher levels of wildlife tree retention, which is separate. So upland tree retention, which is separate from riparian retention budgets. Um, there's, um, you know, a, a, a number of other retention strategies within the FSD, which I guess is viewable online. So people could go and look at themselves and see, you know, when we look at, let's say old growth, and old and mature retention budgets to not are calling for higher levels of retention than what the current Kootenai Boundary Land Use Plan has. So targets uh, for old growth uh, are typically drawn down by two thirds in landscape units that are of low biodiversity emphasis. And we're asking for that to be taken away, full targets in all uh, landscape units. And uh, we also feel that the actual targets themselves as they appear need to be raised. And that's something we're modeling now in the Kootenai Lake TSR to see what the uh, implications of that are. So at a number of levels, uh, Tanaha are asking for higher levels of retention to mitigate the impacts of climate change and to accommodate ecosystem and biodiversity values. Great, fabulous work. Um, I think you you answered this. Um, the person was also wondering um, how you're prioritizing um, the, the needs of protection and, and mitigation, but I, I think you might have just answered it, Marlene. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, okay, a couple more questions here, folks. I know we're getting near the time, but if you can hang on for another minute or two. Um, so uh, you mentioned that statutory decision makers will not force licensees to comply with FSD and that the impediment is a legal one. And something about 
uh, they used amendments to bypass the FSD. Could you explain again, please, how they are circumventing the intent of the FSD? I wouldn't say circumventing, I would say more <laughs> supplementing. Um, essentially, if a, if a licensee submits an FSP that is in compliance with um, you know, for the values in the law, well, then the, the SDM really doesn't have much of a choice but to approve it. Uh, we would like to see more encouragement and enforcement of the standards, but until the legal requirement changes, we don't see that as a possibility. So we have had some licensees who are proposing a non-legal addendum to their FSP. So they'll state a commitment to us that, you know, Hopefully that helps to build a meaningful relationship. We can uh, kind of use that as a stepping stone for building confidence and trust between the First Nation and the licensee directly, uh, but it doesn't have to be upheld at a, a legal stance. And do you have suggestions for how this could be changed? We're hoping um, this new biodiversity and health ecosystem health framework will just leave more room for the stewardship um, values and responsibilities that the Chinaha are already hoping to see uh, enacted on the landscape. We're hoping that DRIPA can come into play to help change, you know, be used the way it's meant to be used, which is changing legislation for, you know, to uphold First Nations stewardship rights and responsibilities. So uh, that's an avenue. Marlene, if you have any comments. Uh, Marlene's question really highlights the fact that there's, there's a current disconnect between DRIPA and FERPA. And that disconnect is, um, it, it remains unclear and statutory decision makers, as Sarah said, if there's compliance with FERPA in the past, what has occurred is that they've been able to sign off on an FSP based just on that compliance. But now nations are beginning to assert their wishes. Um, and so DRIPA is this, this other piece of legislation <laughs> And the two are sort of colliding. And, you know, there's a lot of lack of precedence there. Mm -hmm. how, how do you reconcile DRIPA and FERPA, which often are not, are inconsistent with respect to the wishes of particular nations and what FERPA is telling uh, them is appropriate management. Um, I think there need to be a few challenges happen legally in order to push this such that uh, we get some resolution on where DRIPA sits and is going relative to FERPA, particularly under the new framework that's coming. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, okay, another question. Uh, what relationship do you have with the National Tree Seed Center? Hmm. Uh, Marlene, I don't know if you can speak to this. I know that we uh, typically use, you know, local uh, Indigenous nur nurseries. Um, I'm not sure if we have any connection with the National Tree Seed Network. I could find out and get back to uh, the person who asked that, though. Yeah, I can't really answer that question either, other than the fact that Tanaha uh, has um, nurseries and they rely on seeds from those nurseries that, yeah, are run by the nation. <laughs> Okay, uh, and one more question uh, for those who are still staying with us here. Um, so is there any movement on establishing compensation to nations who have lost their TLU lands due to inadequate planning and protection by industry? I would hmm. hope so. Hmm. Marlene, do, do you know of anything? No, no. Um, it's it's uh that's an interesting question. It sort of kind of goes beyond this discussion here. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you both for being here to fill these questions. It was a great, great presentation, Sarah, and having you, Marlene, here has just really uh, added to our knowledge. And this has been a very important conversation today. So thank you both. Over to you, Haley. You're muted. Thank you. I'm just taking over the share screen and getting warning messages. Are we all good there? Great. Um, thanks to you both once again. Uh, I don't need to reiterate that that was a fantastic conversation. Thanks everybody who contributed. 
to the questions um, just open things right up. Um, Sarah and Marlene, make sure you have a look in the chat. There are lots of kudos coming in there. And while you do that, I want to, of course, thank the financial sponsors who make this series possible. Um, I want to remind everybody who's still here that a recording of this talk and all the previous and all the upcoming will be available on both the KCP and the CMI event web pages. And I want to invite you to the next talk um, coming up, not next week, but the week after. So just um, a little warning that we're skipping a week. And uh, we'll have Larry Price with us, who's going to be delivering a talk called The Integrated Fire Management Planning, Mitigating Risk to the ecological integrity and function of the regional connectivity corridors. And Larry works with the First Nations Emergency Services Society. Um, should be an interesting conversation as well. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll um, turn off my camera and mute myself. We'll leave it running for just a couple minutes for people who are reading the chat. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. And I'd like to say thanks to my mom who watched this presentation with me in conference. <laughs> Awesome.